Well, for those who didn't hear anything, uh, we started with some words from Isaiah chapter 40, uh, reminding us that our hope is in the Lord. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. We're called to be those who hope in the Lord in times like these. And it was great news this morning. Only two new cases in Melbourne. Daniel Andrews has had a haircut ready to come back to work. I've had a haircut ready to come out of lockdown. But among all those things, our hope is to be in the Lord our God, the maker of heaven and earth. A warm welcome to Scots, especially if this is your first time with us and Scots online. We hope you will bear with us through unexpected glitches as we all work at learning some new skills. Our first hymn this morning is drawn from last year's big hymn sing, it is in the cross of Christ I glory. Join me in prayer. Our mighty Lord and maker of the universe, we gather this morning around you and your word. As the one who created and sustains all things, and yet we know with the Apostle Paul that we live in a fallen world where all creation groans in longing for renewal. Father, though you made this world a good place, we have gone our own way. And all of creation carries the consequences. So we look forward together in hope for that better place, that time when your kingdom comes in all its fullness and tears are wiped away. Help us to persevere in hope that we might indeed be those who trust in you and daily renew our strength. Forgive us our times of impatience, of selfishness, of arrogance and grow in us anew this morning a sense of real contentment we pray in jesus name who taught us to say our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory.
forever and ever. Amen. Once again, there is little news this morning for obvious reasons, but I do want to let you know that the Zoom prayer meeting on Thursday, uh, sorry, the prayer meeting on Thursday, the regular prayer meeting, is in fact on Zoom, and the regular members would love you to join them. Details are in Scott's Weekly, which I trust was sent to you on Friday. This morning, another one of our Scott's Tourist videos. These are little videos that uh, we've scattered around the place on QR codes for people who come to look at the building. This one is an introduction to one of my favourite stained glass windows. Take a look. In 1915, the widow of Charles Campbell dedicated a window in the North Isle to her husband. It highlights another famous story told by Jesus, known as the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. In those days, tax collectors worked for Rome, an occupying force. Worse, they were known for holding back a generous commission, taking as much as they could for themselves. They were seen as greedy traitors and were generally shunned. Pharisees, on the other hand, were upright, religious and generally respected. So take a moment to consider the surprising story told by Jesus. The Pharisee and the tax collector were both praying in the temple. The Pharisee prayed, Thank you, God, that I am not like other men, especially this tax collector. I fast twice a week and donate a tenth of all I get. The tax collector, on the other hand, wouldn't even come to the front. He stood a long way off with his eyes downcast and prayed, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Which one do you think went home justified before God? That's the question asked by Jesus, and it's the same question he asks today. Because against our expectations, he's not interested in outward displays of religion at all. He finishes with these words, For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. You can find the original story in Luke's Gospel, chapter 18. Let us bring our prayer of thanksgiving and intercession to the Lord. So let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we praise and give you thanks for you are holy. We thank you for the gift of yourself in Jesus Christ, our Savior, Redeemer, Life Giver and Sustainer. We thank you for his living, dying, rising again in your loving redemption of the world. We praise and give you thanks that our Redeemer lives and will teach us the ways of peace, that we may know the strength of love and the power of forgiveness. We honor and give you thanks for your living word, for you have taught us to be content in whatever circumstances, in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, through Christ Jesus, we can do all this through him who gives us strength. We give you thanks. Faithful God, we are thankful that you are constantly at work in our lives. We thank our Savior and Redeemer, Jesus Christ, for he is our help in times of trouble, strength in times of weakness, a guide when we feel lost, confused, or alone. Lord God, you have the power to transform lives, to turn sorrow into dancing and bring hope out of hopelessness, for you are the hope of our lives and hope of the world. We praise and give you thanks. God of the living, today we pray for those who are affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, whether here in Victoria, Australia, and the world, we pray for those infected with the virus, whether young children or adults, those in isolation or in hospital, or Australians who are overseas and worried that they would not be able to return to Australia. We pray for the frontline workers, doctors, nurses, and scientists who search for a cure, those in the field who work 
long hours every day, hoping people to get tested and those in the labs informing people about their test results. We pray, oh God, we pray for each and every one of them. We pray for a smooth and safe vaccine rollout in Australia and the world. We pray for those who are unemployed, for those in prison, those we meet every Tuesday at Flemington Mission, those who are hungry, sick, alone, and afraid. Lord Jesus, help Christians wherever they are to be given strength and courage to serve and speak the language of God, which is love, because Christ is love. We pray for those who do not yet believe in you, Lord, draw them by the gentle power and love of your spirit, God of all languages and cultures. Have mercy, strengthen and heal your people. May your wisdom and peace be upon them and our broken world. And we continue to pray for our government leaders, federal and local, for our judicial system, police, forces and military, for our prime minister, Mr. Scott Morrison, the members of parliament, health authorities, Australian premiers, the premier of Victoria, acting Premier Victoria, and for all who are part of this great country of Australia and their families, may the Lord God guide and help them to acknowledge you, O Lord, in everything they do and seek your face. God of all nations, we pray for the peace of the world. We pray for your peace in Israel, Palestine, and the neighboring countries in the Middle East, we pray for a better relationship and unity between Australia and China, Australia and our neighboring countries. Move among us by your spirit that you would break down barriers of fear, suspicion and hatred. We pray and ask for your blessing upon the church in the world, especially in Africa, Asia, the Middle East and throughout the developing world. The ministers and missionaries medical workers and aid agencies whose task is to feed the hungry, heal the sick and support the brokenhearted. For small churches to be able to persevere, we remember John and Beck Hudson from Brimbeck Church Plant. We remember Nathan and Tomoko Stewart in Osaka, Japan, Adam and Helene Ramsey in Shiba. Lord Jesus Christ, head of the church, we ask for your blessing upon our church, the Scotch Church Melbourne and Scotch Church constituents, the Indonesian Christian Church and St. Stephen's Flemington. We pray for our senior minister, Reverend Philip Campbell and his wife, Louise, Professor Sen Sanjaya and Reverend Christian Tita at the ICC, Reverend Andrew Wong at St. Stephen's Flemington. Together with the family, ministry and congregation, may the God of hope fill our ministers with all joy and peace as they trust in you, so that they may overflow with hope of the power of the, the Holy Spirit. We pray for our church leaders. We remember the session clerk of Scotch Church and the leaflet editor, Ms. Rosalie Strother, the deputy session clerk, Dr. Rosemary Feather Saha, the previous session clerks, Ms. Ray Anstey and Mr. Peter Armstrong, Reverend Philip Court, who was the moderator of Scots during the faculty. We pray for the elders, pastoral care committee members, music director, Mr. Douglas Lawrence, Scots choir, the organists, music players, the staff and volunteers. We pray for the younger people too, oh Lord, to come into church, surrender to Christ and have the courage to tell the good news of Jesus to their friends and neighbors. Come, O oh Holy Spirit, and revive your church again. We pray for those who are ill in our church and those uh, loved ones who are ill, whether at home, in the hospital or aged care. We pray for healing and strength upon Yvonne Sullivan, Coral Hallock, Alan Nolan, Frances Sykes, Nancy Bang, and as well as Margaret Conradis and friends who are ill in our church community at present. We pray for our friends in aged care and those who are anxious about the future, those struggling with their faith and those who are bereaved. Christ, our healer and comforter, help us to trust you even when our health is failing or in our disappointments, knowing that you are a good and faithful God 
and forever our strength and refuge. Loving Father, thank you for hearing our prayers and bringing comfort, peace, and whatever we need most. Thank you especially for rescuing us from our sins. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The King of love, my shepherd is, whose goodness fails me never. I nothing lack if I am his, and he is mine forever, and he is mine forever. Where streams of living water flow, my ransom soul. come to the final instalment in Paul's letter to the Philippians. Paul Kerr, Paul Kerr is going to read it for us. Uh, Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 to 23. Paul, it's over to you. Thank you. I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need. For I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is like to be in need, and I know what it is like to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Yet it was good of you to share my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, no one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I despise, desire your gifts, what is that I desire more be credited to your account. I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Jesus Christ. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. 
Amen. Greet all God's people in Christ Jesus. The brothers and sisters who are with me send greetings. All God's people here send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Thank you, Paul. Let me pray and then we'll take a look at God's word together. Our Father, this is your word before us. And we pray that in spite of the circumstances, you would help us to be attentive to it, that you would open our hearts and minds to understand your word to us today. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, one of the unexpected pleasures of lockdown for us has been that uh, we've discovered that our building uh, where our apartment is has a little lending library down in the basement with all sorts of random books i chose one at random being locked down and uh, quite enjoyed reading it an insightful little book and a novel set in modern day england called the planner about a young guy who is in fact a town planner and uh, trying to discover for himself the real meaning of life and where to find satisfaction. He's not doing too well. He's living in a little one bedroom apartment rented with just a rubber plant to keep him company. All his worldly possessions can fit into three suitcases. Meanwhile, he goes off to work each day as a public servant, knows everything there is to know about planning codes in inner city London, but doesn't have much else to show for his life. Enter Felix. A guy he meets at a bar who seems to know where to find the good life and offers to introduce his new friend to it. So off they go, learning the ins and outs of London nightlife. The interesting thing that Felix says to James at one point early in the book is, James, you have to find a philosophy because without a philosophy of life, you won't know when you've made your goals. You will never find satisfaction. Interesting, isn't it, in a world that seems to have everything but lacks satisfaction. Well, where indeed will we find satisfaction and where indeed will we find uh, the right page on my notes for my sermon? Uh, seems to have rearranged themselves quite uh, interestingly this morning. Now, I've got to say, uh, if you ever read the book, it's very telling and things don't go so well for poor James. It's witty, it's perceptive, it's kind of sad, but does indeed capture the essence of our time. The Christian blogger Stephen McAlpine says that in the post-Christian West, any sense of transcendence, any sense of anything outside the material world is ruled out, any sense of meaning outside the material can't even be talked about. And so if this is all there is, then all the boozing, all the partying, all the drugs, all the education, all the mortgages, all the prosperity, it amounts to nothing. As James discovers in the planner, nothing really satisfies. The reality is you see, if you're not satisfied today, there's nothing you can buy today it's going to change that because ultimately we will only ever find true satisfaction beyond ourselves. So for a Christian perspective on that, you can't go past the Apostle Paul in his letter to the church in Philippi. A letter from a prison cell that we've been working through the last few weeks. A letter that started out on a note of rejoicing in the partnership of the Philippians in the gospel, even in his jail cell, and ends on a note of contentment, even in his jail cell. These days in Australia, it costs over $300 a day to keep someone in prison, maybe in fact cheaper to send them on a cruise on a cruise ship. Back in Rome, it was very different. If you didn't have friends to care for you, you would live on a diet of half a slave's portion of watery porridge. 
very similar to a World War II concentration camp. If your friends didn't send blankets, you would freeze. Those are Paul's circumstances. And yet in the midst of all of that, he can say in verses 11 and 12, I've learned to be content whatever my circumstances, whether in humble circumstances or plenty. And he has known both. And here's his secret. That his satisfaction comes not from his situation, but from the gospel, the, the message that holds the keys to the book of life. Now, having said that, you'll notice that the Philippians have actually sent Paul some very practical help, and he appreciates it. You might remember from chapter 2, Epaphroditus, that's why he is there with Paul, though Epaphroditus, you'll remember, has been so ill. Paul appreciates their concern. It took a while, but now it's here, and Paul is immensely thankful. Which doesn't mean for a moment, though, that he wasn't content before. That's his point here at the end of the letter. He is thankful that they're concerned for him, but he wasn't complaining. Because either way, he says, he was content. He says in verse 12, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. In the original, it's slightly different in nuance. It's more literally, I know what it is to be made low, and I know what it is to have plenty. And to Paul, you might remember being made low is okay because that's exactly the trajectory of Jesus back in chapter 2. The, the parabola, you remember, though in the very nature God, obedient to death on a cross. What's a little bit of hunger and cold in prison compared to that? For Paul, you see, either way, it's a win, which is why he's content in any circumstances because it's the perfect opportunity to model Jesus. Now, have you ever tried thinking that way when the chips are down for you? Of course, the medieval monastic movement turned this kind of attitude into a lifestyle choice. Maybe short of that, we could just try it when things are tough. Think of Jesus and model on him. Locked down for another week? Why complain? Not just that Paul models Jesus in verse 13, but that he draws his strength from Jesus as well. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. See, that's his reference point outside the system, living for Jesus. That's where his satisfaction comes from. That means he's happy to pour out everything for the sake of everyone else. Now, that's one side of the coin. Paul is at this point on the receiving end of the Philippians' kindness. And he said, I was contented already, but I rejoice in your concern for me. Now, what happens if you've got the same sacrificial Jesus as your reference point when you're on the giving end, Paul there on the receiving end, the Philippians are giving. You might remember again back in chapter one, the thing that made Paul rejoice the most was what he called the gospel partnership of the Christians in Philippi, that they were with him in the same business of proclaiming Christ. Chapter one, verses four and five, he says, in all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And look, oddly, you see, it's the same original partnership word in the Greek, slightly hidden in our translation here in chapter 4, where you can see the word share in verse 14 and again in verse 15. It literally says in verse 14, yet it was good of you to partner in my troubles. Which is exactly the way the Philippians saw it. 
we have American friends who are doing mission work in the highlands of New Guinea, a couple who live with their children in a remote village. But you know, their church actually commissioned and sent two couples, Zach and Cassidy in the village of Doe, and the Lehmans managing logistics from Madang via helicopter. Everything Zach and Cassidy need for their work on call from their mission partners back in town, a three hour flight away. Both couples you see serving in partnership. The Philippians are exactly like that with Paul. The fact is, Paul is so encouraged by their partnership, he just can't stop talking about them. Listen in to what he says about them in his letter to the Corinthian church further south. He says, for I testify that the Philippians gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of partnering in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord and then by the will of God also to us. Can you see the clue? They've given themselves, first of all, to the Lord Jesus, which is why they are then partners in the gospel, backing Paul with everything they've got in the business of promoting Jesus. Because, you see, they were of the same conviction that the resurrection of Jesus changes everything. And so we'll use whatever we've got here, they say, whether our resources to serve, to send them to Paul, to partner in the gospel, however we can. Look again at verse 14. He says, yet it was good of you to partner, again that word in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church partnered with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Now again, Paul is at absolute pains to say he's not angling for anything more for himself. What he's most interested in, what he's most excited about, is the delight that their generosity, that their gospel partnership, brings to God himself. In Paul's mind, you'll notice the old sacrifices in the temple, all the, the smoke and the fragrant smells, that is nothing compared to the Philippians' gifts and their generosity and their gospel partnership in verse 18. He says, I am amply supplied now that I've received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. God delights in our efforts at gospel partnership. And because of that, Paul says in verse 19, God is going to meet all their needs through the riches of his glory in Christ, that they are going to find incredible satisfaction and blessing and contentment in their generous gospel service. Now, friends, this picture, this whole model we've seen this morning, this model of contentment on the one side and generosity on the other, that is meant to be the normal Christian life. And it is radically different to the world's model, isn't it? The world's model is grabbing for so much and giving so little, and still coming up empty, and still saying, is this all there is? I've heard and seen evidence of some incredible generosity in our few months here at Scott's, and I want to encourage you to keep at it, especially generosity aimed at gospel partnership that most important thing that Christ is preached, 
however and wherever we can. And that the love of Christ is shown however and wherever we can. I want to suggest to you there will be all sorts of new opportunities to do that, new ways to be generous as our city comes out of lockdown, new ways to surprise our community with not our negativity, but with our love, with our generosity. New opportunities to love the city back to life new works and new ministries to support as we keep demonstrating our gospel commitment, our gospel generosity, grabbing little, giving much. And instead of coming up empty in the riches of God's glory in Christ, coming up full. Maybe this is a timely reminder for you this morning. Maybe for you, Contentment is elusive, which means you're not only not only not able to be satisfied, but you're also not able to liberally give. Just a reminder, go back and look at Jesus. Because if you've got no point of reference outside yourself, then you'll always be caught up in this that, that treadmill that says, if, if this is all there is, then the best I can do is to try to make myself comfortable and grab as much as I can. And, and contentment and generosity in that model just never makes sense. For Paul and the Philippians, it's all about gospel partnership because of the grace of Jesus. Paul signs off with some final greetings. God's people with him, sending greetings to the church in Philippi. Even greetings, you'll notice, he says, from the Christians in Caesar's household, where the gospel is quietly taking root as Paul spreads the word from his prison cell. Astonishing, isn't it? Already the message of Jesus is pervading the highest levels in Rome. Then two final blessings in verse 20 and 23, both of which lift us right out of our closed system and refocus our perspective. Verse 20, to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. The glory belongs to him and him alone. And verse 23, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Because of that same grace of the Lord Jesus, God's generosity to us in Christ Jesus, is where Paul's letter started and it's where the letter ends. The final amen. So amen to that. Our final hymn is by that most prolific of hymn writers, Charles Wesley. It's love divine, all loves excelling. And it's been arranged for us by our Scots Church Choir principal, Vaughan McKelly.
friends, thanks so much for being with us this morning, whether you've joined us on Zoom or on social media. I'm sure no one was more surprised than Phil Court to see himself introducing that last hymn as part of the big hymn sing recording from last year. Uh, if you are on Zoom, you're welcome to stay for a chat coordinated for us by Rosemary Feathers. Let me close with the benediction. Again, Paul's closing words to the Philippians. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit now and forevermore. Amen.